Hi everyone, Jason here from spiritualbabies.net. Um, another one of our series of kind of what is, and we've gone through so far the Torah and the Gemara and the things that make up the Talmud and things like that. Um, and something that came up in conversation was Midrash and what that is. And so Rabbi Neely has very kindly joined us again, and we're going to talk about this subject of Midrash, which um, I think for most people watching who weren't brought up in a Jewish home, they'll have a very kind of uh, narrow perspective of Midrash. So if someone asked me what Midrash was, I would say it's a conversation around an area of text. But um, I've been looking up <laughs> what Midrash is this week, <laughs> and I don't think it's even possible to give a real definition of what Midrash is. Is that fair? Uh, you're not going to get a one sentence definition. Um, but what you will get is a um, sort of blowing past the the surface version that most people think. The, the, part of the problem is the word midrash is used colloquially and it's used technically. And in the technical sense, there are different varieties. Um, so the, um, the best technical definition or, or word that works in English for midrash is um, exegesis. That is to say, a, um, an, explaining of the, an explanation of the text as itself. Um, but there's some different varieties of that. So first of all, let's let's get past the what most people think of when they hear the word midrash, because the word midrash gets thrown around as kind of a catch-all explanation of anything the rabbis ever said. So many people use the word midrash to mean it's a story, it's an explanation, it's a parable, it's an analogy, it's a metaphor, it's some way the rabbis tried to explain something, um, either explain a part of the Torah text or explain some other aspect of life, and they just were talking, 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 talking. That's not exactly true. Um, it is true that midrashim of a certain type will contain parables and analogies and story type uh, elements, um, sort of narrative uh, teachings and, and philosophical musings, but the core of midrash, both the, uh, of both types, uh, the core of midrash is the original Torah text, and taking from it clues that there is something that needs explaining or understanding, and that the only way to do that is to reach and pull information from uh, other sources within the Torah or the rest of the Bible, uh, especially linguistic clues, um, or to use the internal logic of the text in order to unpack itself, but that is a uh, it is an intellectual exercise. It is not something that just happens because you were reading the text. So, so the uh, let's see if how far we got so far with that with that definition. Yeah, no. It, when I was um, trying to find a a good definition, um, one of the things that seemed to pop up is it's a study of language and words as much as it is about um, a study of what the free what the whole. It seems that the whole message of a chapter may not be this this the focus of the study. The focus of the study might be just why were those words used? Where were they used in other places? What can we get from the other uses of these words and bring to this argument to find it? I think it's called philology. I think that's what I um I dug up the study of right. um, language and words. Philology is the study of words for its own sake. In, in Midrash, we use the words and the understanding of the words, um, both from within that the piece of text that you are studying, as well as every other piece of text within the, uh, the, the Tanakh, the Bible, in order to understand the meaning as it pertains to understanding God or understanding our actions in the world. So philology is perfectly happy just to come up with what does the word mean? Midrash wants to know what does it mean? Right. What are we doing with it then? Where, where do we go with it from here? So there's there's an ad, added layer of of activity or spiritual insight that goes beyond simply the the origin or construct of of individual words. But that description that you gave um, really relies on a basic underlying assumption or set of assumptions that all midrash has and isn't always stated very clearly. It's certainly not stated by the midrash itself, um, but it is stated. Uh, in other places by those who are scholars, which is one, in order to study uh, a single piece of text, you need to know every other piece of text. And that, that's kind of a problem, because uh, if you start on the first page, 
you don't know the last page of the Bible, but in order to really understand the first page, you need to have read the whole thing. Uh, and you need to have pulled together its language as best as possible and its, uh, its ethos in order to then be able to interpret each piece in light of the whole. And, and that's based itself on an assumption that the entire Bible is the Bible that God wants us to have. Uh, that there is a unity to this text that goes beyond just it's all by the same author, which is kind of a, a trite statement, to be that the author who had infinite choice of words and who had an infinite choice of expression and, and ability to style sentence structure and uh, to arrange material chose this unique set of arrangements and these unique words and therefore there is no such thing as just coincidental overlapping. Uh, there's no such thing as, oh, you know, he just wanted to use that word three times in a row because why not? No, <laughs> that basic assumption means that if the, the words are coming in an unusual pattern, if the words have unusual similarities or even just casual similarities, that is something we can use to help us understand each piece better. And, and that assumption has to be made clear right from the start, because otherwise what the, uh, the sages do when they are uh, explaining this through this midrashic methodology, the words of the, the Torah may seem a little odd. It's like, well, why are we looking in the book of Psalms to explain something from the book of Exodus, right? Or why are we looking at the usage of this word from the book of Joshua to explain something over here? It's, a, it's a, Can't we just understand it here? And the answer is, well, no, you can't completely understand any piece without understanding the whole. Is uh, the I, there's a few things we have to have to cover, but I know we've only got thirty minutes. <laughs> is the point of midrash to explain the chapter that the midrash is about, or is the point of it to um, use something that happens somewhere else as an example in from a different story? You can say yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the answer is yes. <laughs> So, so let's get into um, the when scholars talk, um, uh, both academic as well as traditional Jewish scholars talk about midrash. We divide them into roughly two different styles of midrashim. There is halachic midrash, and there is agadic midrash. Um, and halachic midrash, as you might guess by the word halacha, um, deals usually with a verse by verse uh, analysis of each piece as it comes a very close reading of those words as they are illuminated by the rest of the text and the rest of what we know of Judaism, um, going step by step of how do we then understand everything that's happening here and how do we then know what we are supposed to do. Agadic Midrash, on the other hand, um, is starts with the words where we are. So it may, you know, hit a particular word in a verse and go, ah, this is interesting. Let's talk about this. But where it ends up can be completely unrelated to where you began. And the opportunity to share other spiritual insights or, or narrative um, descriptions is taken at, with full liberty. Um, unfortunately, many people take that narrative style and think that the rabbis are just then making up stories. But they are doing it for a purpose, and they are doing it with a textual grounding that is there in both the original text as well as the other texts, they just don't see themselves as being limited to only explaining a narrow interest in that particular moment of, of the text. Let me give you a famous example on that. Um, when we, we get the story of Abraham, uh, which we are uh, reading next week in the, the annual cycle, uh, it begins with this idea of lech lecha, that God says to, Moses, uh, to Abraham, all right, time to move. And in Agadic Midrash, there's this big question of why is Abraham being chosen? Why, why is God you know, speaking to him? What happened here? And they look back at the very end of this week's parasha to the idea of him being an Ur Kasdim, and they say, ah, Ur Kasdim, that kind of sounds like the word meaning a furnace. Um, therefore, he was in the furnace of the Kasdims. Well, why would he have been in the furnace? Well, because if he was going against idolatry, then he would have been uh, a public enemy number one, and then they begin to tell stories of how a person immersed in idolatry might awaken themselves to the truth of only one God. And those insights 
uh, into how a spiritual awakening can happen are remarkably profound and very appropriate for the modern world, where many people are also needing to be awakened to the notion of there being one God. Uh, not usually from idolatry, but more as an awakening against uh, atheism or agnosticism. Um, but that narrative has only that little start flick uh, from the text itself. And then they bring in other sources and other parallels, but the main purpose is to, to try and explain the, the, the narrative of, of who Abraham was and what made him special. Um, there I'm is, hold on, sorry, just as a contrast, there is no Midrash Halakha on that section. It, it just doesn't get covered at all. Because there's no, there's no mitzvah to be explained, there's no um, particular uh, insight of practice to be drawn from that section, so it just moves right past it. Uh, in fact, there is no official collection of Midrash Halakha for the entire book of Genesis. Uh, the, the endeavor of, um, of Midrash Halakha, of that exegesis of specific commandments in a verse-by-verse -verse way, begins at the book of Exodus. I've heard those um, stories about the, about Abraham's beginnings. Um, are they to be taken? And wording, trying to word very carefully. Are they to be taken as serious historical facts, or is midrash something that's a bit more fluid? Because I know people who will say that's exactly what happened, and that's why it's mentioned. But then there's the other argument that this is maybe what happened and we can pull, if we think about that as a scenario, then what might we pull as a moral from this or as an idea? So the, the, the term I usually use for what you're describing is, um, are these journalistic accounts, right? Is this the report in the newspaper? And therefore we assume that it is a intended to be an accurate depiction of events as they would appear to an outside observer regardless of their content or spiritual truth. Uh, there's a, a quick litmus test for how they were intended, which is, are there mutually contradictory reports found within the same page or next page? Uh, and in the case of Abraham, yes. Uh, there are descriptions of Abraham coming to the realization of God as God when he was a child, and there are descriptions of Abraham coming to that realization when he was 45 years old. They cannot both be journalistically accurate. Uh, he, he was either one or the other. And in that case, you realize that there isn't a, a Masorah, there isn't a fixed tradition that the rabbis are passing down, but they are doing their best to understand the story from the textual clues as well as their own experience and insights, and trying to share what they believe happened. Now, does that mean that each individual rabbi believed that how they are describing it is how it happened or something very similar? That I can't always say. Sometimes they are clearly using it as an opportunity to share a, a spiritual truth without making a journalistic claim. Uh, other times it does seem that they are absolutely convinced that this is, in a journalistic sense, what happened on the day. Um, and also, these are the spiritual insights that come from it. Uh, the interesting thing is when you get to Midrash Agadah is that multiple rabbis will offer multiple opinions, like I said, many of which are mutually contradictory, uh, even you know, from the, uh, the ancient rabbis, not just modern interpretation. And that's okay. Midrash Halakha, not so much. Right? Midrash Halakha, you will get multiple interpretations, and then they will fight it out um, to find out which one is the correct reading of the text. And that's because the correct reading of the text when it comes to Midrash Halakha will impact how you do the mitzvah. So if you disagree with it, then we have a, a, a conflict of practice, um, as opposed to Midrash Agadah, where if you disagree with it, we only have a, a, a conflict of thought. It's kind of like you're going down the highway and there's a sign saying, um, I don't know, picnic site half a mile ahead. And you argue in the car whether it said picnic um, site or sleeping site or pullover site. That's not that important. But yeah. if the sign says bridge out, you uh, really <laughs> need to know that that's what it says. You, you um, need to agree on what that means. Or, or more, more to the point, uh, 55 miles an hour speed limit. Um, everybody driving down the road in every car needs to understand what that sign means. And they need to share that understanding. 
and, and Midrash Halakha uh, fights for that shared understanding. So you will have debates about exactly how um, and when Passover is meant to be observed. You will have debates about how you get married in, in Jewish law, um, because um, both of those things are activities that have uh, descriptions in the Torah, but the descriptions are tantalizingly vague uh, of exactly when do you offer the sacrifice, exactly how is it shared, exactly when are you eating matzah, what are you about, you know, uh, the unleavened that's in your house that you don't actually own. These things are important, but they're, they're clues in the text, but they need to be explicated. They need to be explained in much more detail. Uh, same thing with getting married. It says when a guy takes a wife, could you please tell me what that looks like? And in a, in a very famous case, they use the uh, the verb that's used for taking a wife, and they look for other instances of that verb, and they say, well, if this is how you use take here, then it must be also how you do the the wife, and the, and they find the parallels that way, and and you're off to the races. Maybe it was just very early Jewish stand up, you know, take my <laughs> wife, please. Um, <laughs> um, uh, what well, I was. No, go ahead. I was going to say, but one thing to remember is that there are rules. Uh, Midrash halacha in particular, you don't get to just say, well, this word kind of sort of sounds like that word, so okay, let's go this way. The, there are 13 principles of exegesis, um, which are too long to really go into at the moment. I, I'll, I'll recommend some resources at the end um, that limit exactly what is considered an acceptable argument when doing this kind of midrash. Uh, so for example, you can bring an argument for what's called Gezerah Shava, which is equivalency of words. That in a word here and a word there, if they are equivalent words, one word can be used to understand another. Uh, you can use what's known as klal uprat, a, uh, a general statement followed by a narrowing of the statement, uh, a detail of that statement, can have an impact then on how we understand the general rule. Or if you have a general rule with a narrowing and a restatement of a general rule, that will also lead to a different interpretation. Uh, you can also use very famously uh, and, and quite well known um, uh, is a principle known as Kalva Homer, which means if you can learn something about a, a minor case or a weak case, then certainly in a stronger case, the, the rule would also apply. And the Torah, therefore, didn't feel it necessary to say the stronger case, because why waste words, right? If you can teach it that even in this case, then certainly in this other case. Uh, a famous example of that, you know, we learned that we are supposed to do a blessing before we eat. Uh, and if we should say a blessing before we put physical nourishment on our body, then all the more so we should say a blessing before we put spiritual nourishment in our body, which is much greater and more important. And therefore, you should say a blessing before studying Torah. I was um, kind of uh, surprised to find out that the word Midrash actually appears in the text um, a couple of times in Chronicles. So mm -hmm. I looked it up um, and uh, I was thoroughly expecting to find it being used in a context which was totally foreign to the one we have today. And I was kind of surprised that it wasn't. And so I get from that that maybe, maybe Midrash is commentary. Uh, it's, it's actually um, the, the best sort of general definition for Lidrosh to, uh, to ask about um, is to, to inquire. And the idea here is that we are inquiring of the text. We are, we are asking it to explain itself because there's something we need to understand. And, um, you know, could you could you elaborate on that is what we are saying to the text. And we use the text to make that answer. Now, I, I know that for many people who are unfamiliar with Midrash and the style of it, it can seem like the rabbis are pulling rabbits out of hats, that they are they are reaching, you know, over here from off stage and pulling something in that may seem to change the meaning of the text or may add information that doesn't seem to be on that page. But when you are pulling from the same author and when you are bound by the same set of rules uh, of how we're doing this, then it is not a, uh, a magic trick. It is called deep understanding uh, of the big picture. And when you remember that most of the sages in the ancient world had the entire Bible committed to memory, the, the fact that as they were reading and they came across a word that immediately in their mind, 
other instances of that word would pop uh, in, and then they would use those other words to understand this one, we can begin to see exactly how Midrash would have been a natural application. Uh, it's imagine if you had memorized the concordance of the entire Bible. Um, as you were reading, you would constantly be gaining, why this word here? Why that word here? Well, I know in this context this word means that, so that means there must be some overlap. And, and it becomes a much richer text uh, when you look into each word and see the rest of the entire Bible. Uh, you will find that Midrash does not reside only in one book. Uh, up to this point, we have been talking about the Torah, and we talked about Mishnah, and we talked about the Gemara, the Talmud, um, each of which, although often published in multiple volumes, is basically a cohesive book um, to, uh, to have been edited at some point, the Talmud or Mishnah, uh, into their unified form. Midrash comes in a whole range of different books. Um, it, it comes in the early Midrashic books, the Halachic Midrash, um, things like the Mechilta and the Sifra and the Sifre. Uh, these are compilations of the earliest layer of halakha, um, uh, halakhic exegesis um, that eventually became sort of the, uh, the go-to place where the rabbis were gaining their insights when they were doing the Mishnah and when they were doing the Talmud. What type uh, of, sorry, what type of dates do they go back to? Uh, it's, it's hard to, to put uh, fixed numbers on them, but most of them are going back to uh, the century or two before the Mishnah itself would have been written, um, at, at the very least. And many of them contain insights that are probably older than that, um, that had been passed down um, piece by piece. Uh, and then you get the, the more famous ones that people know, which is Midrash Rabbah. Um, so you have the, the section on Genesis that talks about all the uh, insights about creation and about uh, Abraham's uh, youth uh, and, and realizations. And, and those are more well known and widely shared because that is where you find more of the narrative. Um, and as we know, people love stories. So it's an easier container for the insights that are being shared. Uh, but, but Midrash was being compiled and reworked and refined um, to be um, more and more elegant or clearer um, all the way up until around the year 1000, uh, when some of the later uh, compilations were being put together. And uh, you'll find versions of the same Midrash, especially the Agadah, the, the narrative style, in multiple works. Uh, and then it becomes very interesting to go through and compare the, the different variations to see what was uh, being done uh, in each one. Is it helpful for people today to look at Midrash? Is it something that you should do with a teacher? Is it safe to do it on your own? Will it fill your head with strange <laughs> ideas? Um, uh, I know there's, it's, it's very simple to you get a book and it's new information to you um, and if you haven't kind of thought out why this information is here and how you should use it it can kind of sometimes taint people's perception of what's real, what isn't real, what we should take as gospel truth and what we should um, you know take as an idea all right so uh, back to the sources wonderful book for somebody who wants to know more about traditional Jewish texts and not just Midrash uh, but the the Mishnah the Talmud the Torah um, later Kabbalistic writings uh, halakhic writings from Rambam and the Sh and Shohan Aruch from Joseph Karo um, the it's what is it uh, it's edited by Barry Holtz Back to the Sources. A, uh, it's been around for quite some time, but it's still one of the best single volume, help you get a big picture of all of these texts sort of analysis. And really required reading before you dive into some of these things so that you get a grounding of what to expect from them. Midrash Halakha in particular has had um, some good publications of translations recently. Um, I have one here of, uh, of Mechilta that's put out by, uh, by JPS, uh, their classic translation by Lauterbach of the Mechilta, that's uh, the book of Exodus. And it, it has the Hebrew as well, which is always very helpful to be able to compare once your Hebrew skills are up, um, the translation to the original. But I find that Midrash Halakha in particular is a very important link in understanding how you end up in the Mishnah with many of the legal decisions after having read the Torah. Because when you read the Mishnah straight, the rabbis aren't showing their work. Uh, very rarely they will mention, and this is why we came to that conclusion, or this is the verse that we are drawing on. Most of the time they are just plowing ahead, laying down 
what the legal analysis should be without reference to the or, uh, the origin or sources. Midrash Halakha fills in that gap. They were relying on that, but they already knew it, so they didn't need to repeat it. Um, and, they, and they knew that it was kept in other sources. So for a beginner student, getting this verse-by-verse -verse analysis and seeing how the minds of the sages worked is quite refreshing and quite reassuring that the rabbis were not just making up law out of whole cloth. They were analyzing the text and they were reaching very reasoned and rational conclusions according to principles and rules that most of us, I think, were are very much in agreement with. The idea of a unity of an authorship, that the words all matter, that you understand a part by the whole. These are principles that I think most of us will respect. And, and going and reading it, especially if you can get a teacher, um, but if you can't, reading it at least with a dose of humility, that um, any misunderstanding or any inability to uh, appreciate what the sages have done is more likely the fault of the student than it is of the sages, um, I, I think can be a very worthwhile experience. I, I also want to point out that I will often be using Midrash and references to the Midrashim in my Wednesday Lunch and Learn class for going through the Torah portion. So if people are interested in more examples of Midrash, they can look at any of the back uh, videos on that or just uh, click into the, the folder that has all of my past handouts. Uh, however many hundreds there are now, uh, and they will find many, many uh, examples of Midrashim found uh, right there for uh, a case-by-case -case compilation. Is there an online resource for Midrash? Is, is, uh, is, has it been taken and digitalized at all? Well, yes. Uh, in the Hebrew, all over the place, quite easy. Uh, again, safaria.org is the, uh, the best single repository out there. It makes for easy connections. Um, but they have not translated everything yet. So when it comes to translation, much of Midrash Rabbah, the, uh, the more agadic style, uh, has been translated. Most of the Midrash Halakha has not. Uh, so for that, you may still be stuck with buying a book. So that was it for this week. That was um, Midrash. I know where we flew through it in record time. If you... Um... <laughs> If you'd like us to um, throw any questions at the rabbi on this, then let us know in the comments underneath. If there's another part of uh, Judaism that you're very you're interested in, um, especially within the library of of um, Judaism, then let us know, and we can certainly add that to the list. Um, thank you, Rabbi Neely, for giving us your time again this week. We're very appreciative. Always a pleasure. And uh, we'll see you guys very soon. Bye bye.